So this is our topic today, uh, DISC, Unraveling the Big Misconceptions, and a lot of interesting facts by our incredible guest, Dr. Russ Watson, who has been in the DISC world longer than me, which is <laughs> saying something. Uh, Russ, bring up uh, your uh, bio. I want to introduce you uh, because I think it's uh, important. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you know who doc, Dr. Russ Watson is. He and I go way back, back into the uh, early 80s. Uh, you might recognize him from his eight years when he anchored the NBC TV show, Every Man, which was in Chicago. Uh, his research, uh, particularly in the behavioral sciences, has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I mean, it goes on and on. LA Times, Chicago Tri Tribune, many radio and TV programs. He's the author of many things, including Workplace Motivators and the DISC Relationship Insights. Now, Russ wrote his first computerized values and motivators assessment, which was called the Business Values Inventory, back in 1987 uh, with another assessment company, not with ours. Uh, he co-authored the first job analysis DISC instrument called the Work Environment Assessment back in 88. And here's a little known fact. Russ was a semifinalist for the NASA Teacher in Space, that Challenger mission, which is a selection uh, of one of the top 150 uh, educators from over 10,000 applicants. So we have a celebrity with us. We have somebody, in, in my opinion, in all the years I've been in the assessment business and particularly in DISC, Russ is the person who I consider the most knowledgeable on the subject. So we're in for a treat today. And Russ, let me hand it over to you and you take it from here. Tony, thanks very much for that kind introduction. And I also need to uh, share with the audience that uh, it, it, Tony and I had met up long before DISC, just on the speaking circuit. He'd be going out of a concert, so I'd be coming in to uh, various stages. Tony, this is a, a very brief list of your many contributions to DISC, People Smart Relationship Strategies, Platinum Rule DISC. You had, I think, the first online uh, DISC uh, assessment in um, 2000, People Smart, at the virtual training you've done most recently. Wait, I've got a question for you before we start rolling. And Tony, what was a point at which you realized, oh, wow, there is something to this DISC stuff and I want to get involved? What was that tipping point for your time? Well, it was uh, when I was in my doctoral program at Georgia State University back in 1974. That's how long it, far back it goes. I was introduced to the, uh, the four styles, and it was then that I decided I really, really wanted to do this. In fact, I had uh, my doctoral uh, dissertation proposal approved, which was buyer-seller similarity as a determinant of success in sales. And I went to my dissertation chairman, who was, by the way, uh, an author of a multi-million best-selling book called The Magic of Thinking Big. His name was Dr. David Schwartz. I said, Dr. Schwartz, uh, right now my dissertation is based on demographic similarity. I want to make it on psychographic, the four styles. He told me, no, finish what you uh, got approved, get out of here, and then focus on it, which is exactly what I did. So Russ, it was going back to 1974. Fantastic. And, you know, I think everybody, even our good colleagues on this call, we have some rather new people in, in, in Dis on Disc Street. We have some um, uh, experienced people. And th there was a tipping point for everybody that said, you know, there's something to this and I'm going to invest my time. Thanks for that, Tony. Let's, uh, let's get rolling. My own 45-year <laughs> jog. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of conversations and debates I had with John Geyer uh, back in the day. Uh, looking at uh, the, the terrain and some speed bumps, continuing uh, some debates with, with Geyer and uh, making a couple contributions of my own and uh, it, looking at the horizon. So that is uh, sort of where we're going to start. So let's begin. Do you remember chemistry class? When Tony and I were in chemistry class, 
uh, there was um, about 103, 104 elements. A couple of them were theoretical ones. Now there's 118 elements. And some of those are theoretical. So the number of elements are growing. I want to take you back in time, 2,400 years ago, to the chemistry class with Empedocles, the periodic table of the elements, 2,400 years ago, four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Uh, the contemporary version of that, earth, water, air, and fire. And uh, the affluent types have their own uh, version as well. And those were the four elements you already know, the four humors. We're not going to go over that at all. But um, this is a, a really a cool quote from Hippocrates, 400 years before Christ. Men think epilepsy divine merely because they don't understand it. We will one day understand what causes it and cease to call it divine. And so it is with everything in the universe. Wow, 2,400 years ago. I'm blown away by, by his knowledge base and what he offered. You've seen other similar tables to this, so I'm not going to go through each cell, but the humors are there, the temperaments are there, the elements, the qualities, and the characteristics of personality. We're getting into the roots, literally 2,400 years ago, of DISC. Uh, Tony, I have to stop on this slide for a moment. 130 years before Christ, Philosopher physician Galen made these drawings. These drawings are taken now from contemporary medical books in medical school. And they're, they're put in the medical school books, not because the comment is, look how primitive these people were uh, 2,100 years ago. The comment is made, look how detailed this remarkable scientist was in making these very detailed drawings of the human body. Wow, I'm, I'm blown away by that. I found this as a resource. Unfortunately, DISC is not listed, but it takes a look. And by the way, everybody's going to have this deck. So um, I'm not going to go through these cells, certainly. It starts at uh, 400 BC. We end up here at about uh, 98. Fromm is there, and Adler, and Sprunger, and some others, MBTI. DISC specifically isn't mentioned, but it shows the sources of, um, again, each of those models based on four temperaments. And the question is, why always four? I, my observation is there's always a human fascination with four. We have four seasons, four directions twice. And in fact, the First Nation people, Native Americans, planting grains of corn, what stick four grains of corn in each hole and recite this poem. One for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and one to grow. Amazing. There are, are of course, other, other bottles that blow the, uh, the, the, the four box away, big five and 16 PF and, and many others. Uh, let, let's come up now into uh, 19th century. Carl Jung, analytical psychiatrist, he offered many, many notions. One of them was individuation, that our personalities are really a unification of opposites. He's the one that uh, offered this, the, um, the, the four sets of opposites, introversion, extroversion, sensing, thinking, judging, etc. These are currently used in the MBTI instrument, and there are clear differences between a DISC and MBTI, and they do slightly different things. We can talk about that perhaps later, but um, this, is, this is stuff that um, Jung offered. He died in 1961, which is uh, inside of my lifetime and Tony's and, and perhaps some other people here. A great quote by Jung, I am not what happened to me, I am what I choose to become. <laughs> and watch, this one comes close to home. Everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding about ourselves <laughs> with a sage look coming from the psychiatrist. That, that certainly hits home with, uh, with many of us. I love this quote from him, thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. Please, please, I, I think about this one in, internally a lot, especially when people are unleashing their judgment at me. I don't quote this because that inflames their judgment, but I think about it, thinking, okay, you're casting your judgment. That's the easy thing to do. I prefer thinking, and I want to certainly challenge you for some critical thinking as we're going through this. Okay, now we come up to Marston, who died uh, shortly before I was born. 
and uh, you know of his work, uh, Emotions uh, of uh, Normal People, and uh, his uh, DISC initial. Words and meanings change. Marston, dominance, inducement, submission, compliance. These happen to have been four interweaving themes in his Wonder Woman cartoon series. Interesting. Here's a quote from Marston. A person is most happy when they are submissive to a loving authority. Wow. That is, for me, a, a fascinating quote from a, a very fascinating individual. Here's an action item. If you haven't seen this movie, feature-length film, just came out a couple of years ago, 2017. Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. I submit to you that this is a must view video for all DISC colleagues uh, herein. Words and meanings change. Marston's, you already know. This is CGW. This is Cleaver, Geyer, and um, Wiley. Dominance, influence, steadiness, conscientiousness. These are the four from assessments 24 7. Dominant, influencing, steady, conscientious. The 1950s paper versions of these instruments had other words like sweet as a prompt or gay. Gay in the 50s meant happy-go-lucky. Gay now means something very different. So those words have been scrubbed from current versions of uh, a disc. <laughs> words all change. Let's just take one word. 40s, 50s, 60s, the word roach. In the 40s, roach was a bug that you sprayed, stepped on, or kicked out of the house. In the 50s, if you had a roach, you had the slowest car on the block. That was the roach. In the 60s, of course, a roach was the butt end of a doobie, a blunt, a marijuana cigarette. Each of these roaches are being held <laughs> by a roach clip of varying degrees of uh, affluence from more expensive to uh, least expensive on the, uh, the roach clips. And oh, that quiz time. Why is a roach clip called a roach clip? Answer. Yes, yes, because potholder was already taken. Okay, Elmo, enough. Let's move on. Let's get up to Walter Clark. He had the first disc-like instrument. It used Marston's descriptors from an adjective checklist, 1948. He published it in the 50s. It's called the Activity Vector Analysis. It is still available on Market Street. And um, the predictive index uses something very similar to the activity vector analysis as their adjectives checklist. Aggressive, sociable, is stable, avoidant. You can see where this comes from. Clark had an employee. The employee's name was James Cleaver. Graduated from Princeton, he worked for Clark in 1951 on instrument development. Cleaver left, formed his own company in 1956, and the story continues from there. Cleaver wrote the first forced choice disc instrument. In back of uh, uh, Clipper Cleaver are some of his charts. You're going to notice the pure high D here. He calls the oil well fire extinguisher, the person who gets it done. Uh, of course, assessment 24 seven calls the pure high D the producer. In back of him here is the presidential candidate, pure high I. Assessments 24-7 calls it the networker, which are, are more friendly, embracing terms than what uh, Cleaver uh, had. Now let's come up to John Geyer. He had the second DISC assessment, and a lot of people said he, he had the first. He did not. In fact, Geyer used J.P. Cleaver's instrument, box for box, word for word, 24 boxes, four words each, identical to Cleaver's. What Geyer brought to the table was he took each of the, the classical patterns as a weather 15 people and asked them the same set of questions, recorded the interviews, transcribed them and uh, sold them in a bound set in his own uh, library of, um, he called them the, the library of classical patterns. And um, uh, he, he sold that through the, the Performax organization. Tom Hendrickson uh, joined in. Tom Hendrickson just died recently, 2016. Uh, it, he has gear, it's still used, uh, called Thomas International in the UK. There was a three-way collaboration, then there was a split. All three used the identical 
instrument, 24 boxes, four words each, word for word, box for box the same, each with a copyright of their own, J.P. Cleaver, TMAS Management System, and Performax. I'm an inquisitive guy. I called each of them. Uh, Geyer was the most direct, uh, and he was most direct with me all the time. I said, hey, John, how is it that uh, Cleaver and Hendrickson? He said, Watson, it's none of your business. So uh, calling the office of Cleaver and, and Hendrickson, they were a little bit more polite, Hendrickson most polite, saying, well, it's something I prefer not to talk about. We have signed documentation. I said, okay, man, I get it. There was an NDA. He said, yes, there was. Okay, fine. Geyer formed the multi-level marketing company, Performax. Bob Pika was the uh, genius designer of the multi-level uh, program, the network marketing piece. Sam Gardner handled the details, which uh, Geyer typically uh, avoided. Some key people, Sandy Karn was their first field manager. She networked, networked all around the country. She was a neighbor of mine in Wheaton, Illinois. And uh, I believe that she might have uh, signed up brother Tony Alessandra in uh, many marketing things. We can talk about that later on, but she signed up, Tony, I believe. Uh, Bob yes, Pekin and did. Betty Bowman. She did. Okay, thank you, Tony. Yes. I, I thought so. Uh, there's a backstory there. And she was, she, anyway, a one, wonderful, wonderful woman um, and, and still is. Um, Bob Pekin and, and Betty Bowman trained, uh, certified many consultants nationwide. Those three people built a major piece of the Performax network. Uh, John Geyer sold that to Carlson Learning Company in 1984. I called him and asked, how much did you get for the company? He said, Watson, none of your business. Uh, in, in the 90s, it was changed to Inkscape. Then it was sold to John Wiley. This was a public number. It was sold to John Wiley in 2012 for $85 million. A disc with a lower I trademark it does not mean that Wiley discovered DISC and everybody else is copying their uh, copyright. It does not mean that. It's simply a registered trademark. What I learned from, from Geyer, uh, we were both debaters. In college, we were both debate coaches. He won some national competition. I wasn't that good. Uh, and I don't think our school ever entered. But I asked him, John, why is it, why do you call it compliance? I said, I've trained with a lot of high C's in the room who say, we are not compliant. And they resisted passive aggressively if they didn't like the rule. So when I, I took the, some of the high seas to, um, uh, to lunch and said, well, well what, do you, what do you comply to? And they said, we comply to rules to which we agree. So I called Geyer and I said, hey, man, here's some fresh information from a bunch of high seas. They say that they comply to rules they agree with. And Geyer said, yeah, so? I said, well, so I'm making a point. And then we did formal argumentation. Point, support, support, pattern of evidence, conclusion, seal the point, and then over to the other person for rebuttal. And I said, okay, John, can you concede that high C's comply to rules that they agree with? He said, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. They comply to rules they agree with. I said, okay, great. Now, can you issue a memo to the Performax network to let them know, hey, realize this. That, and he said, next question. What do you have, Watson? What's going on? I said, so you're not going to issue a memo. He said, I said, next question, Watson. So that was clear. Move on. <laughs> he lamented the pressures of a multi-level organization. Um, every, as he, the, the, the Geyer's words, every year we got to come up with a new product to throw over the wall, his words, to the distributors. And some of the products were of lesser quality. The flagship was always DISC. He had wrote a book, uh, Energetics of Personality with his second wife, uh, Dorothy Downey. Uh, there is a letter that I have from his son, Dan, read it at uh, John's funeral. We are at time. So if we were ahead of time, I would have read the, the letter. It's about a two and a half minute read. I can send it to you if you send me an email, if you like it. It's a moving letter. It gives you some color about uh, John. High Ds, we know, have a high impression of who they are. High Cs are always cautious, cautious risk takers. High Ss are possessive of their stuff. Do I have enough stuff? If I planned, do I have enough? And oops, the high eyes always forget to read the memo. In the interest of full disclosure, no animals were injured in any of these photographs and the bear is going to be okay. 
let's move up to uh, Eric Fromm. Eric Fromm also uh, died within my lifetime and the lifetime of some of you here. I had a professor in college who was a student of Eric Fromm. Eric Fromm wrote many, many books. One of his books was Man for Himself. I know, yes, it was a sexist title, but give him a break, he wrote it in, in the, 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 the 60s, the 50s. He said there was a non-productive side of DISC. Productive side, dominance, influence, steadiness. Look at the non-productive side, takers, attractors, receivers, preservers. So we know people of a strong DISC propensity. And sometimes if they become non-productive, the high D becomes a taker. And I'm not gonna go through the others, but I, I saw this as, a, as an important nuance that uh, Fromm offered. Whoa, okay, let's take a break. Some people might say, oh, gee, Watson, there's too much data here. Uh, you're going to have all of these slides. You can go over them later. High Cs might say, well, it's, it's OK, data, but it's going too fast. Uh, sometimes we know when there's too much data. <laughs> and we could uh, either slow down or modify the data. Uh, full disclosure, don donkey is going to be OK. My own contributions to DISC, uh, tangent to some of the work that Tony was doing with his uh, colleague, Jim Cathcart, in the late 70s, early 80s. He came up with a telephone profile. I re refined some of the keys to communicating. I, my doc is in educational psych, so I did a lot of study with learning styles. So we take a look at this just very briefly. Two dimensions in a telephone profile. If you listen for the rate of speaking and place it on some kind of a spectrum, faster or slower, and if you listen for how the person answers your questions, open versus closed, we can put that in a four box. Ds and Is talk faster than Ss and Cs, who talk a little slower. Is and Ss will answer your questions in a more open way. Ds and Cs answer your questions in a more closed way. If you know that, and if you talk to anybody, think of your, your relatives, think of your friends that you talk to on the phone daily, you can place them without saying, hey, do a brain dump on, on this, uh, this piece I've got for you, but certainly the the uh, instruments do an enormous amount of benefit. I studied, studied a lot of learning styles. Here's two different theories that I had combined. One is a cognitive tempo theory. That tempo theory says those of impulsive tempo respond quickly, both verbally and on tests. Ooh, 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 call, call, take me, call on me, but they make more errors. Reflective types respond more slowly and they tend to be more accurate. Nobody's wrong. They're just different in their cognitive tempo. The other one is dependence. Field dependent are people oriented and field independent are task oriented. We can take those two theories, put them in a four box and we come up with this. Ds and Is tend to be more impulsive learners and trainers. Ss and Cs tend to be more reflective learners and trainers. Is and Ss tend to be field dependent. What this means is that they can uh, work in groups. And at the end of the session, they can have a group hug. The, the, the D, Ds and Cs tend to be more field independent. Well, send it to me in an email, send me the book, I'll read it on my own, and I'll get back to you, send me a quiz. So if you know this about some of your audiences going into any kind of a training situation, I think this can be a valuable tool that can help you just do a mental prep before you walk in the door with who you're gonna have and what kind of activities you might have. Uh, I did a little work in the early 80s on, on fine tuning just refining, polishing the edges of managing and motivating. And what I submitted to the greater DISC community is we manage someone from what they need to grow in their personal effectiveness. And that comes from natural style. Um, we motivate from someone from what they want back from the organization. And that can come from their adapted style. Some DISC vendors measure with a micrometer mark with chalk and cut with an ax. <laughs> That's preposterous. We don't need a micrometer. We don't need an ax. Chalk is okay. Chalk is good, colleagues. You can chalk on a whiteboard. Uh, you can make a little longer line, a little shorter line. You can erase it, make a bigger bubble, smaller bubble. Chalk is good. And here's why. Colleagues, please, disc is not a CAT scan. 
DISC is not an MRI. DISC is not spectrographic analysis. And DISC, my good colleagues, is not chem screen analysis. It's none of those. It's a self-perception assessment entirely dependent upon many moving parts and many variables over which we have no control. Personal insight, willingness to self-disclose, ability to situationally focus, honesty, objectivity, avoidance of malingering, and, and mood at the time of responding. And we could come up together with another eight uh, moving parts here. These are 16 disc vendors. Please, these are listed alphabetically. These I have observed as the major players of long form disc assessments. By long form, I mean long uh, input, the, the 24, 28 boxes, 26 boxes, and, uh, and long form output, detailed output. You can go over this yourselves in parens. I have the sources, as I've been able to determine, of where the roots are for those uh, specific disc vendors. Here's some homework for you. These are new disc providers. They're coming out every year. These are five new ones just in the last five, six, seven years. And I'm not going to list or comment on each of them. You, you will have this uh, slide, but I encourage you to check out their websites. Each one brings a different nuance to Disc Street. Each vendor brings their own ideas. Nobody is wrong. They're simply different. Disc terminology varies. Disc length of lists vary. Brief lists versus long lists. There's pros and cons to each. Report length varies. Pros and cons to each. I hear some people say, well, our report is better than yours because our report is 49 pages long and yours is only 37 pages long. Well, that's a preposterous comment. They're different. Two graphs, three graphs, one graph, some say, well, we have to have two graphs. Some say, well, we have to have two, three. Some people say, don't make it confusing, just do one. It's my understanding that Assessments 24-7 allows you a choice between two or three or one graph. Nobody is wrong until they are. Nobody's wrong until they are. DISC is not the original against which all others have copied and breached copyright. DISC is a registered trademark of Performax, then Carlson, then Inkscape, then Wiley. I have heard distributors say, well, we have the original DISC. Your brand is just copying the DISC. I politely tell them the DISC is a registered trademark. That's all. The lower I, there's a backstory there. Interesting uh, thing. If there's time, I'll give you the backstory. Beware of 100-point scales. Beware a comparison of 100 point scales. Zero degrees Fahrenheit, really cold outside. 100 degrees Fahrenheit, really hot outside. Let's take a look at Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius, fairly cold outside. 100 degrees Celsius, you're dead. Let's take a look at Kelvin. Zero degrees Kelvin, 100 degrees Kelvin, you're dead at both ends. Okay, so beware of making assumptions. Ignore the big bold print numbers here. Let's just take a look at this 100 point scale. Some will say, well, this is a percentage scale and this score is then 95%. No, it's not 95%. It's 95 on a reference point range from zero to 100. We don't have 100% Fahrenheit. It's a reference point. The reason in my observation that most assessment vendors disk motivators, uh, attributes, any, any other kinds of measures, they'll put it on a 100 point scale. Here's the reason, good colleagues, to hide the, the specific scoring points, to hide their, their scoring graph. It's only 24 to 28 questions on, on most disk. And if it's a percentile, then it's gonna be a goofy graph with 40, 60, 40, 50, 60, all scrunched up in the middle if you were there that day in statistics. I don't wanna go there. We have a 95 and an 84. I have heard some colleagues sitting around conference tables or in hallways 
borderline part pontificating. Well, I had these two clients, uh, a person A, person B. Person A was a 95 disc, a person B was an 84 disc. I met for two hours with the 95 disc telling them, you got to lower your disc a little bit, your D, because uh, you're going to talk with your partner here who's an 84. Met for two hours with the 84. This is all billing for the the, the time. you gotta, you got to boost your, your D up here a little bit. And, and I used to go ballistic 30 years ago. I used to go ballistic at the table. Now I've learned take a breath and just excuse yourself back up the table, the chair and just walk away from the table. Beware the difference between a score of 95 and an 84 on almost any disc scale, colleagues, may be as small as one item choice. One question. So Wait a minute, you're, you're milking time from people that you're milking time from two high D's trying to get them to do a job. They made a, a one choice, one question difference. I caution you not to do that. DISC is, a, is an enormously beneficial instrument. Don't get down in the weeds. This isn't blood chemistry. I failed calculus twice as a college student, but I have a statistical chip in my brain. So I get it when I see descriptives in Kronbach's alpha. I love Amos structural equation. This is from some work I did with some, some colleges. Structural equation modeling is fantastic. It's confusing to look at, but it's brilliant. And once you know the key, it's outstanding. I wanna do a statistical experiment. We were gonna do a survey ahead of time. And, and I've done this real time live with about 600 people in three or four different audiences. Taking a look at Kronbach alpha. And uh, we do have a, a poll coming up. So get your poll wrist ready and Jared will be ready to post. Oh, just a minute, Jared, if you can remove that for a moment. Can you pull that question back? Excellent. Thank you. It'll come up for you in a moment, good colleagues. But here's the question. And as I take a look at your DISC scores of your peers, the group aggregate scores, especially of the D and the S, uh, just a moment, if you pull that back, we're good, we're good to go, it's, it's, all, it's all good. The, the group aggregate scores say that you may, as individuals, you may individually consider yourself to be among some of the top safe defensive drivers in the country. If you think, in a, you, you, you'll see the poll in a moment, if you, if you say that that statement is true for you, as uh, just as a disc consultant, that you can see yourself in one of the top safe defensive drivers, please give a uh, yes or a no to the poll that Jared will put up now and um, ad advance that uh, as we have opportunity. And I think that will jumpstart, here it is. So if you can, uh, please do your, um, do your wrist up to a yes or a no. I wanna see how, uh, how well you match with the other four or 500 people that have already uh, taken this, uh, survey, and I think that's probably long enough to have folks respond uh, unless they're still coming in. So Jared is the keeper of the we, poll. We still have some coming in, Russ, so I'm going to give okay. a couple more sure. seconds here. And sorry about okay. that, Russ, I had to... Uh, no, uh, no, it's okay. It's all good. It's all good. We're... Uh, that's all. This is... Uh, this is not CBS or NBC. This is a sincere amateur production, like all webinars are. <laughs> so it's all good, colleagues. And, uh, and that's probably enough to display what we can learn from that. 66% uh, say yes, they consider themselves uh, among the top uh, defensive drivers. Interesting. Okay, I want to do one other uh, one other question. So if you close off that piece, we'll, we'll wrap all of these results in a moment. But uh, remember that uh, two thirds of you say, yeah, yeah, that's me. There, there's another question. I'm not going to read these uh, pieces to you. There will be four sentences that will come up. I'd like for you to read them silently. Count on your fingers, each one of those that you would say, yes, yes, that applies to me. And I'm taking this response from the averages of the I and the C uh, responses from the Kronbach Alpha. If two or more of these results apply to you, I want you to say yes when the poll emerges. If only one or none apply to you, then I'd like you to say no uh, to the poll. So I'm not going to read these to you because I don't want my tone of voice to influence your choices, but here they are. Here's number one. Number two. 
Number two. Number three. And number four. Okay, there's four statements in front of you. If two or more apply as you introspect, then please vote yes. If one or none apply to you as you introspect, then say no. Let's take a look at what happens. And we'll use your wrist to uh, choose the uh, response. And I, I, I went through those somewhat moderately. I was a slow reader in college. I voiced every word I read. But uh, I'm assuming that numbers are probably tapering down. They are. I'll give everybody just a second here to wrap up. Very nice. And let's see how uh, many we have for yes or no. Coming up, 77% yes, three-fourths of the audience, over three-fourths. Remarkable. Interesting. Okay, we'll, we'll close that off. I want to wrap some of this in a moment and um, move on with uh, one other uh, topic here and faking it. Can we fake our responses to a disc or a motivators or anything, any other kind of assessment? For example, if Tony, Alessandra and Brandon at assessments 24 seven, if they were hiring an accountant, could we, and you don't have to answer this please in chat, that is more rhetorical. Can we modify our answers to approximate an accountant? If Tony is looking to hire a salesperson, could we modify our responses accordingly? I submit to you, good colleagues, that the answer in my observation is yes, we could. And not that it's recommended, but it, it can other people do the same? I submit to you, my good colleagues, that yes, other people can do the same because they're much more assessment savvy now than they were in the 70s, 80s, when we were still using paper instruments. Another question here, can we fake our interpretation of one's disc or motivators reports? In other words, can we add that disc motivators reports are rich with a lot of good solid information. Yeah, to be clear, can we provide additional information that's not related to one's disc score and put that into a disc? I, well, yes, as coaches, we can. And I, I strongly urge you not to do that ever. And colleagues, I did that. I did that just a few moments ago. Observe. I fooled you a few moments ago with my statistical experiment. I apologize for the uh, fooling you, but I want to make a point for your own critical thinking. Item, safe and defensive driving habits of DISC consultants. The reality, this is real hard for me to say with a straight face, 90% of US drivers place themselves in the top 10 to 15% of defensive drivers in the country. I got to repeat that and try not to laugh, but I can't. This, this is a, came from a, a survey by the National Highway Tra Transportation Safety Administration. 90% of people say, yeah, I'm in the top 10 or 15%. And, and of that, when there's a follow-up question, 70% of that 90 say, you know, yeah, I'm up in the top 10, 15%, but, but some of my friends, and I got some relatives that are not there. They're not there with me. So... <laughs> My technique was this. I linked the statistic to your group aggregate score and asked, does this apply to you? Item. The other four items. In reality, 84 to 93% of an audience will list at least two of those items as true for you. In this audience, 77% 
rated at least two of those items as true for themselves. And some people in the audience may have seen me do this before, and so they, they may have already voted no just because they knew this, this punchline. I, I, list, I linked that list to your to the fictitious group aggregate scores. These techniques are simply called cold reading. They're cold reading techniques used by charlatans, fakers, mind readers, entertainers, and some coaches, not necessarily disc coaches, but some other coaches who will uh, uh, say they have some divine uh, mystic powers of discernment. This is maybe a provocative part, causing either strong reaction or provoking critical thinking, which is my purpose here to provoke critical thinking. Some assumptions may lead us to false conclusions. Some charlatans are now mixing, and these are, are coaches and, and other charlatans, they, they mix cold reading techniques into their clients' sessions, whether it's report results or just uh, talking to them about their, their, uh, with their life coaches. And they'll say, well, I have a special power of discernment. That's why I cost $500 more than those other uh, disc average people that can't do this stuff. Cold reading techniques, reading techniques are very common. Uh, they, they use hot buttons, uh, fire, water, earth, air, ring, key ring, whatever. They use essentially the fallacy of personal validation. They tell the subject this is because of a specific pattern that, that, that this result emerges. A lot of specific hooks. Uh, and, and I'm going to stop here for a moment because for men, uh, the most accident prone male protoplasm in the human species are third and fourth grade boys. So if you were a, a third or fourth grade boy, you may have broken your wrist, arm, or ankle because you did some boneheaded thing jumping off a staircase or a porch. Uh, if you are the parent of a third or fourth grade boy, or if you're the grandparent of a third or fourth grade boys who are going to visit you at Thanksgiving or Christmas, buy some bubble wrap, wrap their arms and legs so that when they do a boneheaded stunt at your home, they're not going to <laughs> injure themselves. Women have a lot of, they, they perceive they have a lot of water accidents. As a, a girl is learning to swim, uh, she might have uh, got disoriented underwater and think, oh, oh, oh I'm afraid I'm going to drown. That happens around uh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade girls. Those are simply statistics. They're from cold reading sources. They're usually uh, free and you can buy high quality lists. Human tendency, we remember the hits, we forget the misses. It uses stats and to build some semi-educated guesses. The charlatans will link their spiel to something specific, lines on your palm, arrangement of cards, tea leaf design, or disc and motivator scores. Two types of cold readers, eyes open types, are charlatans fakers who know exactly what they're doing. They do it to entertain people. That's okay, we pay for the entertainment. They usually have a disclaimer. The information here is for entertainment purposes only, or there's some unethical coaches who will unethically, this is my opinion, unethically, trick unsuspecting people. Th that's probably 90% of psychics are eyes open psychics. This percent comes from the psychics and entertainers themselves. The eyes closed types are simply incredibly naive people who actually believe they have some kind of borderline divine mystical powers. And they've learned cold reading only by trial and error. They may be completely ignorant. I'm not saying stupid. I'm saying incredibly naive and ignorant about formal uh, cold reading techniques, probably 3% uh, of those people. I'm not encouraging anyone to begin using these techniques. Unethical is my opinion. And I'm sharing this just so we can recognize it and call it out when you see it. A lot of resources. I Googled just this morning, cold reading techniques, and I got 192 million hits. So if you think that's a rare topic, just Google that and you can find a bunch of sources. I'm not encouraging any of this. Uh, and again, I think it uh, is something that I want you to think about critically and uh, recognize it when you see it, that's all. Disclaimer, I'm not an employee. In pre presentation here is my own. It's not been approved by uh, uh, assessment 24-7. Elmo, let's move on to the last portion of this event. There may be, good colleagues, a train wreck waiting to happen. The train wreck's name is Disparate Impact. This is a formal doctoral level study from the University of Memphis by Drs. Kenneth Basaya, Dennis Kerner, and Russ Watson. Full disclosure, Dennis Kerner and Russ Watson funded this doctoral level research that Dr. Kenneth Bessiah did. 89 assessments here that were surveyed. 
And of the 89 assessments, 22, which is really 25% of the assessments, made disparate impact claims. Five provided disparate impact documentation. That was 6% of these 89, wide variety of, of um, assessments, not just DISC, but the bunches of others. Full disclosure, Assessment 24-7 was a participant, and it was one of the five companies providing appropriate documentation. Why is it a train wreck? Here's why it's a train wreck. Good colleagues, when a candidate doesn't get a job, or they don't get a promotion, or they don't get a transfer that they requested, and the candidate believes, the candidate believes that the results of were for, it was the result of assessments that influenced the decision. And the assessment company doesn't have disparate impact documentation. Colleagues, all the candidate has to do is find an aggressive plaintiff's attorney who files a disparate impact lawsuit in district court of that assessment company. And that will encumber the assessment company in ways not yet fully tested by the courts. Third party validation, this is a screenshot from the Assessments 24-7 website. They have a seal from the Assessment Standards Institute saying that they have third party validation. There's also self-validation. Some companies do that if they're internally equipped. There's a, a differences there. Full disclosure, I'm a member of the Assessment Standards Institute. The president is Dennis Kerner, excellent statistician. I take the statistical tables and turn them into cogent paragraphs so that those who are statistically challenged understand what the numbers mean. What do I do for fun? This little speck up here on the mountainside uh, off of Malibu Canyon is me and my son. My son is much more skilled at rappelling. I'm the one here who looks scared woodless. <laughs> uh, my son ties himself off and he says, Dad, smile, pretend like you're having a good time. And uh, I was happiest when we get back, it got down. When you're on a rock, whether you're rappelling or climbing, some of you may know this, it's all about being in the moment. You cannot think about statistics. You can't think about assessments. You think about <laughs> how am I going to you know, finish this task? When you start a rappel, the only way off the rock is when you reach the bottom. When you start to climb up on a top rope, the only way off the rock is when you safely is when you get to the top. That's it. My doctoral dissertation that Tony had mentioned at the beginning uh, it made some news and it broke in the New York Times and then went uh, uh, nationally from there. This is before Al Gore invented the internet. So uh, 1982, it was difficult to keep track. Uh, both political parties wanted copies and this was before PDFs or easy PDFs. So each copy had to bound up uh, a couple hundred pages. Uh, I felt blessed by uh, being able to share that uh, information. Here's a bunch of presentations, articles made largely around student academic assessment. You don't need to read any of that stuff. I was honored, as Tony said, to be one of the NASA 150 uh, semifinalists for the NASA Teacher in Space, the Challenger mission. I learned 20 years later from a wonderful cousin, Wendy, on the East Coast. Uh, my family's from Ohio, and uh, cousin Wendy told me that our grandmother from Ohio happened to have been a third cousin of some other Ohioans who happened to have been the Wright brothers. For me, that was a, a, a full circle poignant uh, moment, as it were. During this session, we have taken a look at some assumptions. We have uh, taken a look at uh, some new uh, competition. And in a nutshell, I have attempted to unravel maybe some misconceptions and give some kernels of ideas. With that in mind, this can be chat time. If you wanna choose one item to use as a sentence starter and then fill in the sentence in the chat and uh, the chat I think will be able to be saved and you can see what other people have said. And with that in mind, uh, and, and by the way, I think uh, Suzette is going to be the keeper of questions. So if you have a specific question, put that in the question box for Suzette, but I'm going to throw the first question or feedback piece to Tony. Tony, finish one of those sentences for you. And again, you know a whole lot of this stuff. 
Well, uh, I discovered that uh, the DISC concept is not just good in business, you know, in terms of uh, managing people and uh, selling or influencing people, but also I'm raising children. I have four children, Russ, one D, one I, one S, one C. That's as and, it should be. <laughs> uh, it, it really, it's, it's incredible what I have learned just from those four kids in terms of how they react even to little things like uh, uh, coming home with their report cards and how you need to handle the differences. Being fair doesn't mean treating everybody the exact same way. So Amen. That's, uh, that's what I discovered. <laughs> Very good. Suzette is keeper of the questions. What has emerged so far on your screen, Suzette? Yeah, one thing I think we want to um, go over is validation since we have a couple of questions about that. So kind of a two-parter for you. Um, what's the difference between third-party validation and in-house? And as you're talking about that, we had another question saying, given the continuance of new input throughout the years, how do you respond to the reliability and the validity of each one? Okay, um, difference between in-house and uh, third-party validation. Some companies are equipped in-house with uh, a science team. They have some statisticians and they do stats on a routine basis. And if they are equipped, then it, certainly those companies may choose to do self-validation and there's nothing wrong with that. Pros and cons to each. Self-validation is less expensive because you don't have to go out of house. Uh, there are cases, and I'm not making any kind of comparison here, but there are cases where um, an airline engine company will self-certify their airline engine. Uh, there will be cases where an airbag company will self-certify and say, hey, our airbags are good to go, put them in cars. I'm not implying that uh, that, that same is a tangent to other, um, other uh, assessment vendors. And uh, the other part of the question is, as far as timeline, if you do a sample, uh, if for if assessments at 24-7, if we do a, a, a time uh, series uh, sample of statistics, that's good for a couple of years, three, four, five years. Uh, words don't change that quickly from the 40s, 50s, 60s. Yes, when we take a look at decades, but it, it ballpark to make a concise answer, uh, every three to five years might be an appropriate time to uh, re-examine that. And I should also mention that as, at uh, Assessment Standards Institute, we do not rewrite assessments for companies. We say, these are your strong items. These are the softer items you know your model, go fix the soft items. And that's exactly what we did with uh, assessments 24 seven. So we remain instrument agnostic, company agnostic and say, here's, here's the good stuff, here's the other news and go fix as you wish. Yeah, Russ, I wanna, I wanna add something uh, that you have uh, been a gentleman about uh, but when uh, the difference between a third party and an in-house uh, validation, uh, third party, uh, it's totally out of your hands. Whatever they come up with, that's what it is. But in-house, uh, when you look at the stats that come in, uh, you know, depending on your, your level of uh, honesty, you can fudge things. Not, not saying that anybody does that, but that is a possibility that that you don't have when you go to a third party validation. That, that's true. Third party has no skin in the game. And with your permission, I'm gonna stop the screen share because our good colleagues know what the, the prompts are. They can certainly be creative and add their own. Is it okay with you if I stop share? Absolutely, do it. Okay, and then we will go into uh, gallery mode or whatever mode our good colleagues uh, have. And um, that's, that's all good. Other questions, please from um, uh, Suzette. Yeah. Yes, and just a note to our, um, our attendees here, please put your questions in the Q&A section. They disappear very quickly in the chat and I'm not able to keep track of those. So any questions in the Q&A section. Another one we got a couple of times was actually about Big Five. So if you could tell us you know, the differences between Big Five and DISC, I think that would help with those particular questions. Okay. Um, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version 
there's <laughs> there's an academic version. Uh, I'll give you the cliff notes. In my observation, Big Five is DISC. Very close tangent to DISC with one extra dimension, and that is neuroticism. So it has openness to experience. I'm not going to go through each of their dimensions. But if you look at the definitions of each of the dimensions, there's a, a rather close lineup with DISC, except for the other X factor, number five, neuroticism. Now, if, if, uh, if we were working in a, a company, we had a bunch of, uh, of the uh, <laughs> hundreds of people on the call. Anyway, uh, if we were all working for a company and our manager comes in and says, OK, I want you to take this uh, uh, big five assessment and it's going to have these dimensions. And one of them is neuroticism. How many of us are going to raise our hand? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me the, the, the assessment that has neuroticism as a scale. That's just my opinion. It may be a little tougher sell. That's the Cliff Notes version. Uh, another Great. question, Suzette? Yep. Um, another one that came in after that. How have you tended to solidify the learning of DISC principles so people don't make assumptions? Solidify DISC principles so people don't make assumptions. That's a very good question. I think if we take a look at the root of each of the disc and we listen to what brother Tony just said a few moments ago, how to treat four different grandchildren. If you know that you are going in to do some sales training in a room full of typically high D's and I's, even in technical sales, because they'll usually bring along a technical support person who answers the details, uh, you know that you need to be uh, pretty much on point, brief, interactive, and uh, prepare to be spontaneous and maybe be challenged. If you are going into a room full of chemists or accountants uh, who may tend more to be S's and C's, we can make some assumptions on a global basis that are going to be more accurate than inaccurate. Uh, the the questions that I asked you, the, 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 the fake questions, we had 66% say, yes, yes, they're all very safe drivers. And 77% said yes uh, to those other items. We can make some logical, critical thinking type assumptions, and we will be more right than we are wrong. And if the, com if the competitive edge is being more right than you are wrong, then making some critically thought out assumptions is an appropriate pathway. I hope I did some justice to that very good, very good question. Yeah, Russ, let me, uh, let me ask one last question. And is it okay, uh, there's a lot of comments and a lot of questions. Is it okay if we uh, give our audience uh, in the chat box your email address if they have any questions that they wanna send directly to you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, stick in my uh, email address, russ at drrusswatson.com. Doctor is abbreviated. So it's drrusswatson.com. And uh, you may be able to save the chat. I'm not, but I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what uh, folks have had as far as their learning or their realizing and maybe relearning. And I know, I know we have some senior members of DISC here. So a lot of the stuff you already knew, some of the stuff you might have known and forgotten. And I would submit that there's nothing wrong with being reminded of stuff that we had, you know, at, at one point forgotten about. Uh, there was one last question for us before we end. And sure. I, I just put your email address in the chat box. Anybody who is on the call want to look in the chat box. Again, it's russ at drrusswatson.com. But the, uh, Here's the question. Why does DISC continue to be disparaged within the academic or higher education circles? Why do they see the big five as empirical or scholarly and DISC is not? Well, I'll start it even a little bit earlier than uh, big five. MBTI was used before DISC in academic settings. So anyone who had a Psych 101 class or went into their college or community college uh, tent 
for career counseling. They did a brain dump on MBTI. MBTI owned the academic marketplace. So we have a whole bunch of psychologists and HR types who were born and raised on MBTI, who leave, they go out and about in the industry, and we've got a disc vendor walking in. They, they, the person says, no, time out. We do MBTI. Um, from there, Big Five made some solid um, gains in ac on Academic Street by publishing some academic papers and having some known researchers behind it to say this is also uh, on par with, uh, with MBTI. That didn't happen in my observation with DISC. So if the triumvirate of Cleaver, Hendrickson, and Geyer, in, in different order, formed, uh, got into Academic Street. The only one who was really an academic there was uh, Geyer from the University of Minnesota. If he would have stayed on Academic Street with DISC, not done a, a network marketing, not done a multi-level, which then would have been a whole different spiel, it's my opinion, DISC would have greater favor from the HR people and the psych people who have gone through college and taken assessments. 